This morning I want to speak to you from the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and uh, I'm going to have four verses there as kind of a jumping off place and uh, talking about everything that happens in this chapter, but the first four verses kind of set the context. The message this morning is from terrified to triumphant to the glory of God. From terrified to triumphant to the glory of God. And uh, so I want to begin reading in verse 1 of Second Chronicles chapter 20. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Meunites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea out of Aram. And behold, they are in Hazan, Hazazan, Tamar, that is, in Gadi. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. From terrified to triumphant to the glory of God. I was talking with Cindy. Uh, I do that a lot now that there's no kids around. and uh, (laughs) She probably wished there was some. But nonetheless, uh, you know, the the whole thing is is, uh, pandemic, COVID, and all that stuff. We've learned a lot of new words. and, uh, And I said, it seems like there's two extremes that, uh, that have kind of polarized people. And uh, I'm going to preach on both of them. Uh, today, I'm, I'm preaching on fear. There's a lot, lot of fear uh, surrounding uh, what's happened, and a lot of people are afraid. I, 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 I'm, I'm certain there are some people that may never go outside again because of, of things that have happened and, and, and the fear. The other extreme is anger. I've seen a lot of angry people. Uh, and uh, it seems like that, that that schism is wide and broad and entrenched. But the people of God don't need to be afraid and they don't need to be angry. Um, and so this morning I want to uh, talk about that fear issue. And then next week I'll be talking about anger. So hang on with me and let's go through both of these. Uh, when it comes to anger, there was a high school teacher who had been teaching about uh, different theories and different laws to the students. And Uh, she had explained to the uh, students in her class about the law of the pendulum. The law of the pendulum. I I didn't know it was a law, but evidently it is. And and the pendulum, the law of the pendulum is, you know what a pendulum is, it's hanging on. I don't have to explain to you. And so uh, if you pull a pendulum back so far and release it, it swings so far. But the law of the pendulum is it'll never come back farther than it, then it started. It'll come back just a little less than. And so she had explained that law of the pendulum to her class, and she gave an assignment to the students that their job was to demonstrate one of the various laws that she had been teaching them. And so one of the students got very clever, and he decided that he would demonstrate the law of the pendulum. And so he made the teacher stand with her back to the blackboard. And then he rigged up the string in the uh, ceiling and uh, the pendulum hung down and he stretched it out to about an inch from her nose. And then he let it go. Well, the law of the pendulum is it'll never come back further than you let it go. And so the teacher stood there. The teacher knew the law of the pendulum. The teacher understood it and believed in it. But when the pendulum was speeding back towards her face, she jumped out of the way. Now, I'm saying that to say this, that when we get afraid, when something frightens us, we, we don't use all of our rationality. And sometimes, even though we know the thing won't hurt us, it still frightens us. And so fear can be a very devastating thing and uh, there's different kinds of fear. There's different kinds of fear. Uh, there, there's, the, there's the fear of uh, rejection. 
A lot of people really, really are afraid they're going to be rejected. There's a fear of suffering financial loss. There's a fear uh, of being uh, around dead bodies. There's, it's actual, uh, uh, they got a name for it. Uh, there's, there's a fear of water. There's a fear of dogs. There's a fear of the darkness. There's a fear of everything and uh, uh, fear of public speaking and so forth. And then there's that sudden kind of fear, that panic type fear that we talked about. That's when the pendulum is coming towards your face and you suddenly lose it and you get out of the way. That's panic type fear. But then there's a, a, a type of fear that just, it's kind of creepy. And when I say creepy, I mean it creeps up on you. It kind of settles in your spirit and in your heart. And that's what I call anxiety. Anxiety is a type of fear. Uh, anxiety is an overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear often marked by physical signs such as tension, sweating, increased pulse rate, all kinds of things, agitation, uh, unable to rest. Anxiety plagues people. Uh, we've had a plague of anxiety going on in our nation for years uh, because of the number of, of medications that are prescribed because of anxiety. And so anxiety is a very real thing. And uh, Christians, for Christians, fear and anxiety is like throwing sands in the gears of life. It just clogs everything up and it just brings us to a halt. Fear and anxiety has the capability of freezing us in place, making us unable to function and operate as we ought. And so for Christian people, we need to learn to turn our fears into triumphs for the glory of God. And so the central truth of this message is this. Christians can triumph over fear by standing firm in faith, all right? So let me just point out a few things about Jehoshaphat and this situation and show you two or three very simple things he did. The first thing I want you to see is that that, that is the reality of fear, the reality of fear. Fear is a reality. There was an enemy coming against Jehoshaphat. This was a real enemy. It wasn't a fictitious enemy. It wasn't a, 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 a figment of his imagination. They had swords. They had uh, knives or whatever they carried back then. And they meant to come and kill, steal, and destroy. And so uh, when Jehoshaphat learned the news, he was quite naturally terrified. And that's because God has created us with a fear response. There's, there's a healthy fear response. I mean, if you sit down on, a, on one of those fire ant hills and you feel the first one bite you and you look down and there's eight of them crawling up your ankle, if you ain't afraid, something's wrong. Amen? So uh, we, we got this fear response that's quite natural and quite normal, and it's not sinful. It's not sinful to experience fear. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are supposed to fear God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, uh, when it's all been said and done, fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. So there's a healthy type of fear, uh, and, and, and we, ought to, we ought to have that. Uh, but there's a fine line between concern and, uh, and worry. There's a fine line between uh, being concerned. My mother-in-law uh, was a very pious Baptist woman, taught Sunday school for many a year. And uh, she knew Jesus said not to worry. Uh, but she had a tendency to uh, express her concern a lot. And uh, we asked her one time, we said, Anna Mae, don't you know the Bible says it's, it's, it's sinful to worry? She said, I never worry. <laughs> she said, I'm just really concerned a lot. And so, 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 Sometimes the distinction between worry and, and, and concern is, is very slim, very, very close. Concern is good, concern is wise, and concern is healthy. But worry is fruitless, painful, and destructive. Worry is usually a down payment on, on things the devil wants you to buy that he never delivers. And, uh, and we don't need to worry. And like I said, fear and anxiety becomes sinful when it freezes us and keeps us from doing that which God calls us to do. And so he was afraid. The second thing I want you to see about this is he got a report. 
And there was a report that provoked his fear. And I want to point out two or three things about this report. The first thing I want you to see is it's an unexpected report. He wasn't expecting it. Uh, now, prior to, to, to this event in chapter 20, Jehoshaphat had been to war on a previous occasion several years earlier with his neighbors who were called Israel of the northern kingdom. And I don't have time to go into all that, but I just will say this. It didn't go very good. And Jehoshaphat came home, and he was embarrassed, and it had been several years, and so he wasn't really looking for a war. He was a good king. Uh, he followed the Lord and, and uh, uh, everything. And, 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 and by this time, he had established himself as the king and was doing very well. And out of nowhere, all of a sudden, the enemies on the eastern side of the river attacked. There, the Edomites, the Moabites, and those other bites. And uh, they, were all, they were all coming. And so I'm sure that uh, he's wondering, what's up with these guys? Why all of a sudden now? Where did they come from? What, what got them stirred up? And uh, uh, it's easy to wonder why when these unexpected things happen. Uh, you know, uh, it says in verse 2, a report came Jeho Jehoshaphat. Have you ever got a report unexpected from the doctor that just rattled your cage? I mean, just shook you to the core? Let me give you an example. Did you ever go to the doctor thinking everything was okay, and the doctor said, we got to do some tests, and then when the test came in, the doctor calls you up and says, you need to come in. I need to go over this test with you. And when you got there, he told you something, and he said, you have, and you fill in the blank. Brother, that is an unexpected report that will scare the likes out of you. Uh, how about this? I've never had this experience, but I've often thought about it. I pull home, I, I drive home, pull in the driveway. There sits a patrol car. Uh, the lights are going slow. I get out. A patrolman walks up to me looking solemn and somber, and he starts telling me that somebody, some loved one, some, some person in my family has been in a tragic car accident, and they're at the hospital in critical condition. Brother, that's an unexpected report that will shake you to the core. Sometimes it happens that way. Sometimes you just don't see it coming, and it scares us. And then there's times when the devil sends out reports. <laughs> the devil sends out reports. I was just thinking about David and Goliath. You know, David and Goliath, you read that whole story? For 40 days, that, that old giant had been walking out there begging somebody to fight him. He came, come on out here and fight me. The whole army of Israel was hiding in holes, hearing that nonsense every day. Little old shepherd boy David, he goes down there. He says, what's up with this giant? They start telling him, anybody kill that giant gets riches and gets, the, gets to marry the king's daughter. David says, well, I'll fight that giant. And then all of a sudden, they start giving him a report on the giant. Do you know what that report was about? That report is to get David to sit down and shut up and not do anything before he ever gets involved in the battle. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants to scare us. Satan wants to intimidate us. And Satan wants to send a report that will so frighten us that we freeze up and not do what God has called us to do. And it's a report oftentimes from the devil himself. All oh, the reports. Have we not all heard all kinds of reports? You can say amen. This is live now, all right? Uh, well, there, 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 there's reports flying around all over the place about everything from every angle. I'm not on a side. I'm just telling you the truth now. There's reports, reports all over the place. I'm going to tell you the worst, worst place to get your reports. You say amen. If you don't, Facebook is the worst place to get your reports. Thank you. Thank you. Facebook has turned the average American high school dropout into a medical genius. <laughs> we got people reading Facebook, and all of a sudden now they're experts on medicine, law, theology, and government, and then pass 10th grade. Many of these reports that we're hearing all over the place on everything are just fabricated out of thin air and it's gotten to the point where you don't know what to believe. 
Turn it off. That's the best thing to do. Now, we need to be informed. I'm being a little bit silly, I know, but we do need to be informed. The king needed information. But he does not take that information and sit frozen with his bad report obsessing over the situation. The scripture plainly says in verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid. And so unexpected reports naturally cause us fear. The question is, the question is, 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 is that uh, what are we intending to do? Will the king allow uh, the fear to freeze him in his tracks or will he act in faith? So the first thing I want you to see about this is the report was unexpected. The second thing is it's an un unprovoked attack. It was an unexpected report. It's an unprovoked attack. These enemies, these Moabites, these Ammonites, and the rest of these ites, I said, uh, they were descendants of Lot. If you know the Old Testament uh, book of Genesis, you know Lot was Abraham's nephew. You remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot fled the city with his wife and his children. His wife wanted to go back into Sodom. She looked back. God turned her into a pillar of salt. But Lot then camped out in a cave with his two daughters. The Ammonites and the Moabites are the offspring of Lot and his two daughters from an incestuous relationship. And the reason that's important in this story is because if you read on down in verse 10 of the chapter, Jehoshaphat is praying to the Lord and he says, Now behold the sons of Ammon and Moab from Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. They turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they're rewarding us by coming to drive us out of your possession which you've given us as an inheritance. You see, these enemies have no reason to attack. Israel had been extremely graceful to them, and by extension, God had been graceful to them because God ordered the Israelites to exterminate the Canaanites, but he allowed them to live. God gave them grace. And so this is an unprovoked attack. In other words, we don't deserve this attack. We didn't do anything to make them upset. How often do you feel, or maybe you don't, but... I know that it's a tendency to feel that if I just live right, if I just follow all the rules, if I just do everything the way I'm supposed to, then I'm going to be secure and I'm going to stay insulated from harm. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do everything right and then nothing bad will happen. Then out of nowhere, for no good reason, something happens that threatens our peace, our well-being, and, and, and maybe even our life. Why? Why? And, and, and when this happens, you start thinking, God, why would you allow this to happen? I was doing everything I was supposed to do. God, why did you allow this to occur? I didn't do anything to deserve this. It's not fair. Anybody ever said that to their self? Don't answer that. You know what? The enemy... And when I talk about the enemy now, I'm talking about Satan. Satan does not need a reason to attack. He don't need a reason. Here's why Satan hates you. It really don't have anything to do with you. Satan hates you because you are the object of God's love, and he hates God, and he can't do anything to God, therefore he attacks you to hurt God. That's why the enemy attacks. When seemingly unprovoked threats come, we're tempted to doubt the goodness of God. We get into this, why me, God? Why me? Why did you allow this to happen to me, God? I can imagine King Jehoshaphat must have wondered, why are these enemies attacking me? After the grace we've shown them, this is how they repay us? God, this is wrong. Yet the king did not camp out and wallow in the sewer of doubt and despair. That's a dead-end street that will get us absolutely nowhere. Dwelling on the cause of unprovoked attacks will keep us frozen in place. And so we've got to learn through faith to turn these terrors into triumphs. The third thing I want you to see about this is it's an unpredictable outcome. There's an unpredictable outcome. It's an unprovoked attack. Uh, 
it's, a, it's an unexpected report, and then it's an unpredictable, unpredictable outcome. Now, he received this report, and what he received was that there's a massive army coming, and they're breathing down your neck. And they intend to invade, conquer the nation, and the king was afraid. Now, I'm sure that just like every other human being in this place, Jehoshaphat started running the what-if scenarios through his mind. Well, what if? What if we do this and what if we do that? Or what if they do this and what if they do that? See, one of the things that invading armies did is they killed all the old people, they killed all the, uh, the men, and they kept the women and the children. The children became slaves and the women were abused. And Jehoshaphat, all this is going through his mind. What if? What if? And it's an unpredictable outcome. I can't do anything to stop this. It's just a wave that's come over us. And he has no ability to predict the outcome. What if they burn the city? What if they ravish the women? What if they take us into slavery? What if they kill me? What if they kill my favor? What if? What if? What if? And sometimes when we don't have a feeling that we're in control, we, our mind just kind of races into the what ifs. Fear causes us to imagine. It causes us to worry. Fear causes us to try to gain some kind of control, to retreat to some place of, of security where we think the enemy can't get to us and can't frighten us. But this threat, this threat that comes upon them is like a tornado. It comes out of nowhere. It's uncontrollable. They can't stop it. Have you ever been in a situation like where I, if I could just grab a handle somewhere, if I could just get something to hold on to, but there are no handles and the outcome is unpredictable and we're frightened. So how did Jehoshaphat deal with this fear? Well, that's an important question and here's why. Unless and until we learn to deal constructively with our fear, we're apt to remain frozen cowering in fear, or simply just give up. And that's not an option for a child of God. We can't live like that. And so the enemy, Satan, the devil, is attempting to use fear to defeat Christians and to shut down the evangelistic message of the church. That's what he wants to do. Satan wants Christian people to shut up. Satan wants Christian people to stay hidden. Satan wants Christian people to stop preaching the word and to stay silent and stay put and to stay quiet. And the Christian gospel must not be silenced due to fear. We cannot allow fear to set the agenda going forward. So what can be done? Well, we hear reports. They're unexpected reports. We have an enemy He's attacking unprovoked, don't need a reason. And the outcome is unpredictable. We can't foretell. But what can we do? Well, I want you to see three quick things, and this is what, this is what he done. I believe if we do these three things, we'll, we'll overcome fear. He terrified. He went from terrified to triumphant. Jehoshaphat made some key decisions. And... Uh, when fears come upon us, we have some choices we need to make. We have some choices we need to make. Sometimes we need to make and remake these choices every day. So in other words, this is not something you just decide to do one time and it's over with. You may have to keep reinforcing this choice and reinforcing this choice. Let me give them to you. They're all in the text. Number one, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. When, when we're afraid, seek the Lord. It says in verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord. Now the phrase, turned his attention, literally means to set his face. He turned his face. I remember when I was a kid and my mother wanted me to really hear something she had to say. Uh, she would literally get my face with both hands and make me look at her in the face so she could say it. <laughs> Uh, she, she, wanted my, she wanted my undivided attention. In verse 4, notice it says, Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. Then all the cities of Judah came to seek the Lord. You see, we have a choice. We have a choice. Uh -oh. 
will, will, will we face this choice? We will either face the choice and either uh, dwell and obsess on the report or we'll set our attention on the sovereign power of Almighty God. You see, our minds and our souls are designed to concentrate and to keep our heart set on one thing at a time. In times like these, you and I, we've got to choose. Are we going to focus on the report or are we going to focus on the Lord? Are we going to focus on the unfairness of the situation or are we going to focus on the Lord? Are we going to focus on the fact that we can't tell what's going to happen tomorrow or are we going to focus on the one who controls tomorrow? Amen. Listen, we can seek the Lord. You know what Jehoshaphat did? He called a solemn assembly. That's what he did. He called a solemn assembly. He said, all right, everybody, let's get together and let's pray. Think about this for a moment. How logical was it? You've got enemy troops surrounding from a foreign nation. The logical thing to do would be to go out and beef up the weapons, set guards, call in the infantry, draft as many people as you can, get as much armor as you can, and get ready because here it comes. He doesn't do any of that. He calls people and says, let's have a prayer meeting. We're under attack. You see, that don't make logical sense. He called a solemn assembly. Uh, the whole nation of Judah has to turn its attention toward the Lord. Now, here's why. When we get our focus on the Lord, we begin to see the threats of the enemy through the lens of God's sovereignty and his love. Whatever threats are coming against us, what we need to do is we need to see them through the lens of God's sovereignty and God's love. God is sovereign. God has control. God, God is all-powerful. There's nothing God can't do. And have you, have, you, have you meditated on the fact, have you meditated on this, how much God loves you? My goodness. He loves you so much, he gave his only begotten son to redeem you, even when you didn't even want to be redeemed. He, he sent forth his only begotten son to die on Calvary's cross because God loves you. Do you think God's going to let harm come to you? Only temporary, but not, not permanent. And you see, we've got to get focused on God and his love. And so... Uh, I think it might do us some good sometimes when we feel anxious, when we feel uh, afraid, when we're feeling out of control. Turn off Facebook. Unplug the television. Find the Word of God and start reading the promises of God's Holy Word. The Bible says in, in, in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Listen, fear is real, fear is natural, and at times fear is helpful. But fear is unhealthy for us physically, emotionally, and spiritually when we live in a constant state of fear. When we find ourselves worrying, it's a good time to draw, draw aside, get alone, turn off the media, and turn your eyes upon Jesus like the old song says, look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so we can overcome fear by seeking God. Notice the second thing. They sent up unified prayers. They sent up unified prayers. As I said, the nation, the, the, the leaders of all the nation came to Jerusalem to unite in fasting and in prayer. They call a solemn assembly. The solemn assembly, or the prayer meeting, if you will, was a, listen to this, the solemn assembly, this, this statement right here is worth you being here this morning. Prayer meeting is a spiritual act of defiance to the devil. If you was awake, say amen. amen. I just said something that would make a Lutheran shout. Prayer meeting is an act of spiritual defiance to the devil. He wants, us to, he wants us to handle it ourselves. We get on our knees and start seeking God. We're telling God, we can't handle this, but you can, hallelujah. You know what? Uh, prayer is the most powerful thing we can do praying together against an enemy strengthens our resolve we must pray together 
especially when we keep hearing these bad reports. When we pray together, we encourage one another. Corporate prayer is the one thing Satan wants to stop. Do you know Satan doesn't care very much if I preach? Satan doesn't care very much if we gather together. He doesn't care if we have meetings. He doesn't care if we have committees. He don't care if we have teams. He don't care if we have welcome centers, buildings, pews, carpet, stages, praise teams. He don't care. He just wants us to not pray. Because it is in prayer that we latch on to a holy God who will move on our behalf. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be be made known to God. And here's what God will do. And the peace of God, that means the peace God has. Now, I want to ask you, how disturbed is God? Not very. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will Guard, will stand guard on your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We can do that. We can do that. And if we do, God will. Satan knows that when we pray together, worship together, seek the Lord's face together, our fears subside. We go stronger in our faith. We stop being bullied by the bad reports. And he'll do anything to stop that. Now, I want you to notice a couple things about these prayers. Uh, this prayer here. I won't dwell on it very long, but first off, I want you to see it was a biblical prayer. In verse 6 and 7, uh, the, 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 the king says, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens and are not you ruler over all the kingdoms of the nation? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to your descendants of Abraham, your friends, forever, forever? And uh, now skip on down to verse 9. He says, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and you will deliver us. Most of y'all know that he is quoting Solomon's dedication prayer in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Solomon, all he's done is called the people together and prayed the promise of God to God. That's what biblical praying is all about. I remember old John Bassanio, who's now gone to be with Jesus. He said he learned about faith when he promised his daughter he'd build her a tree house. And he said he had made that promise a couple of weeks earlier. And one Saturday afternoon, he was sitting in his, uh, watching SEC football. <laughs> he said he was sitting in the den. He heard a racket going on outside the window. He looked out there, and there was a six-year-old girl dragging two befores down the driveway. He said, honey, what in the world is that girl doing now? And his wife said, well, you promised to make her a treehouse, and she's just getting everything ready. Well, beloved, listen, faith is us just getting things ready so that we can receive the promises of God. God will do what God promises to do. And then there are bold prayers. It's a bold prayer. In verse 12, he says, O our God, will you not judge them? For we're powerless against this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. God, we don't know what to do. Now, on the surface, if you just read the words of that prayer, it seems like he's praying in weakness. It sounds like a weak and helpless person. God, I don't know what to do. God, I'm I'm out of answers. They admit that they're helpless, and they don't know what to do. And then down in verse... uh, Oh, I'm, uh, uh, Paul, Paul says that when, we're, when, when he is weak, God is strong. Do you know when we pray in weakness, that's when God gets the glory? Uh, when we are weak, our heart, a weak heart produces bold praying. Uh, there's a theologian named Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee. Some of y'all have read his books. 
and uh, Watchman Nee wrote a story, wrote a, uh, an article one time, and he was talking about this principle of, of when we're weak, then God is strong. And he said he, he had a hard time understanding that. How can God be strong when we're weak? And uh, he asked the Lord to show him, uh, make it plain to him. And he said he went to meditate on that passage uh, down by the river, and he said he was sitting there while he was watching the, the river. He saw a swimmer swim out so far, and then the swimmer got in trouble, and uh, he, was, he was going under. And he, watchman, he said he watched the lifeguard dive in. And as the lifeguard swam out to the swimmer, he saw him go under and come back up. And the, and the lifeguard got right up to him, and he let the guy thrash around in the water, and he just keep on thrashing around, and he went under about two times. Finally, when the guy went limp, the lifeguard grabbed him, hauled him back to the shore, and saved his life. Watchman, he said, I didn't understand what that was about, so I went and asked him, why did you let him get in such bad shape before you rescued him? The lifeguard said, the state he was in, had I approached him and got very close, he would have tried to save himself, but he would have drowned in me. He would have pushed me under the water trying to save himself. So I had to let all the fight get out of him before I could save him. Do you know human nature's that way? Sometimes God has to let all the fight get out of us before he'll reach down his sovereign hand and do the work for us. And that's what they're doing there. They're saying, Lord, we are powerless before this great multitude. And Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it. But our eyes are on you, God. Our eyes are on you. So it was a biblical prayer. It was a bold prayer. And so they called a prayer meeting. They called a, they sought the Lord. And then they sent up unified prayers. And then the third thing, and this is it. They sent out the praise team. <laughs> they sent out the praise team. Now, they had this big prayer meeting. And uh, during this prayer meeting, believe it or not, the preacher got a word from God. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 15. Listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. This is the preacher now. He's gotten a word from God. He's saying, listen up, everybody. Listen up, king. Thus saith the Lord, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours but God's. Then look in verse 17. You need not fight this battle. Station yourselves, stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. Now look in verse 22. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against them, so they were routed. Now, I'd like for you to just go home and read this whole chapter because really it's great. Uh, they, they, they had this prayer meeting and they asked God what to do. And God spoke to a preacher and said, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, tomorrow morning, get the praise team together and send them out there so they can sing hallelujah. Now, does that make sense? Does that even make sense? Let me ask you something. Where was the battle won? I'm telling you, where was victory decided? Was it not won in the prayer meeting? Did they not have the victory before they got up off of their knees? We need to learn that our victory comes in the presence of the God, uh, of God in the presence of God in the prayer meeting. How many battles are we going to fight without the Lord's presence? Once the spiritual battle is, is one in prayer, fear subsides. We'll be amazed at what God does if we'll just begin to fight our battles on our knees. They get in touch with the Lord and, and they decide to go, go to battle, but instead, instead of sending out the military, instead of sending out the infantry, they didn't even have any Marines back then, but if they had them, they'd have to hold them back. Listen, you guys can't go. We want the praise team to go. Kevin, hallelujah. You guys can go out and take care of this bunch. We done prayed now. Well, when and if we win the internal battle over, over fear, we will have victory when the actual battle begins. And somebody says, well, why did they send out the praise team? Well, somebody has to shout hallelujah. 
Amen. Somebody needs to declare the good work and the glory of God. Amen. Somebody needs to stand there and say, Hallelujah, look what God's done. And then the army, all they needed to do is come back and gather up the spoil the enemy left behind. You see what happened here? They went from fear to hallelujah to getting riches off of the enemy. Only God can do that. Wow. I, I stole this illustration from another preacher, and I, I, I give, if I knew his name, I'd give him the credit, but I don't. But anyway, it, it matches, it goes along with what I'm saying. He said he was on an airplane. They were flying back from some mission trip, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the pilot came on the intercom and said, we can't serve the meal. We're in too much turbulence. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. I have a time or two, but it usually levels out. They go up or down or something, and they fix it. But he said this was terrible. This was terrible. They were, they, if he said, if they had been, hadn't been tied in their seats, they would have been bouncing their heads on the ceiling, you know. It was one of them kind of flights. And all around, people were sick, and it was just terrible. He said everybody on the plane was just fearful. They were afraid they were going to crash, except one little girl. One little girl was sitting over there in her seat. She had her seatbelt on. She had her legs folded, and she was coloring the best she could through all those bumps and everything. Never got excited, never looked up, never, never cried anything, sat by herself through the whole thing. They finally landed and started deplaning. And so this preacher said, I couldn't help it. I had to go ask her. He said, I went up to this little girl, and I said, Darling, I noticed while we were on the plane, everybody was so afraid, but you weren't. You were calm through the whole thing. You just sat and colored. How come you could be so calm when everybody's... She said, well, it's very simple. My daddy is the pilot, and he was taking me home. <laughs> Beloved, our daddy is the pilot. It might get bumpy. It probably will get bumpy. We're going to get unprovoked... Uh, uncontrollable things happen all the time. But our daddy is the pilot. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? Bow your heads, close your eyes this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you want to come to the altar this morning, you can. I, I, I know you're going to uh, maintain your, your proper distances. With every head bowed and every eye closed, here's what the Word of God says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, everybody's still praying this morning. You might be listening to this message and need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe you've never really uh, bowed, your, bowed your knee or bowed, the, bowed, bowed your will to Christ and said, Lord, here's my heart. Take my life. I want to live for you. You can do that right now with a simple prayer. Just ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Believe that he died on the cross for you. The Bible says if you'll call on his name, he'll come into your life. He'll give you a new life. And then there, there are others who maybe what you need to do this morning is make a commitment to commit this verse to memory. I'm going to memorize this verse, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And I'm just going to keep saying it over and over to myself. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, today we thank you so much that you're a sovereign, loving God. And that, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. There's, there's nothing that comes in our life that, that you don't know about. Things rock us, Lord. Things scare us. But, Lord, we, we have you hanging on to us. And I'm just thankful, God, I don't have to hang on to you. I'm just, I'm just so glad that you hang on to me. And Father, for those who may be experiencing anxiety or fear, 
we certainly don't want to belittle that or make it sound like it's non-consequential. It's a real thing. So help us to encourage one another. Help us to, to love one another. Help us, Lord, to help one another through these days of uncertainty so that we won't be frozen, but the Lord will be free to serve you as you would have us to do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.